contact with them. Skills that we need for enhancing children's protection and for working with each other. So some of that are skills to actually work with each other and to listen to each other. Some of it is around working with children. Um, not all of us have a background in that, have particular skill in that. So let us be thinking about competency to be working together to more effectively protect children and, and work with children on their protection. I come from the CPMS background, so uh, you can see that standards indeed um, are an opportunity for us to work more collaboratively. Um, we sent out, when we revised the CPMS in 2019, we sent our standards to leads in all of the other sectors, and we had um, uh, feedback from our food security colleagues, and we at the CPMS have also had the honour to feed into revisions and, and new uh, sets of minimum standards that have been released over the past few years. So we think it's very important that we collaborate at that kind of level. Tools, we'll be hearing about a few of the tools that are in use in other sectors and with protection actors as well. So we look at, we see that as a real opportunity to make sure that in the sectoral tools, technical tools, that we reflect and see the key areas where we can be collaborating more effectively. Then in evidence and learning, some of that will be highlighted today in um, some of the research and ways of working in food security. And we had a session, if you weren't part of it yesterday, we had a session on some of the evidence and learning. Um, so do go back and, and listen to that, um, to that session if you can about working across sectors, the evidence in action. And then finally, a platform that we can create um, as we try to influence the, the leadership in our sectors and in humanitarian action with large around joint advocacy. So to think about um, how, for example, when we have common uh, coordinated collaboration and so on, how we then need to advocate to um, our leaders in at different levels to ensure that we have the funds to be collaborating, that we're given the time to collaborate and from the earliest possible opportunity. So if we move on to our next slide, we want to um, be going to, um, uh, sorry, actually, before we do that, we have one other poll that we want to learn a little bit more about you. Um, so, the poll is about, it can be launched, have you run a project that integrates child protection with another sector? So we're just looking for a yes or no answer. We've got probably about 20, 25 people, uh, technical people, humanitarian staff who are on the session. We would love to hear from you. If you could give us a little click so that we know. Who we're talking to, how much experience you've had. All right, could we see the results for that? The vast majority of you have indeed run a project that integrates child protection with another sector. So it'll be interesting to hear maybe in the breakout rooms and so on, um, which of those, um, which of those, uh, sectors it is. Actually, we can, yeah, indeed, put it in the chat here and we can be looking at that while we move to the next presentation. So I think we have to skip the next slide if I, I already had a sneak peek, because we're not gonna go to breakout rooms straight away. If we could go to the next one. Yes, so we are going to have um, a presentation from our colleague, uh, Patricia Ramos. Patricia is a technical manager with World Vision in Venezuela. Um, and as we're exploring at this um, annual meeting, new ways of working, Patricia is going to talk to us about working with faith-based organizations and enabling um, faith-based organization, organizations to take the lead in children's protection and humanitarian action. So let me pass the floor to Patricia, who is presenting in Spanish. Um, and she will talk us through a little bit how that looks different, how those partnerships look different and what we can be learning from that more largely. Patricia, over to you. Buenos dias, muchas gracias, Joana. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Joanna. I'm Patricia Ramos from World Vision Latin America. 
and I would like to invite you to watch this short video to see what we are about. He trabajado con los niños y ha sido una experiencia muy bonita, muy bonita de verdad. I have worked with children and it has been a beautiful experience. This brought the opportunity to bring the community together. I felt super good and it felt from the sky to me because I shared more with my child because of the pandemic, he was not going to school. Promoting the healthy occupation of children's time outside of school, keeping them away from violence and the risk of child labor. This has given the children a sense of belonging, and I know that they will never forget this, because they're growing up and they're realizing, as the Bible says, what a child is taught in his way, even when he is taught, he will always have it with him, so that what you teach them here today, they will always carry with them. As the seed has a process to bear fruit, so it's in life. From the same seed of beans, I sowed a kilo there. We're sowing that seed of belonging to them. We're giving it back to them so that they will understand that tomorrow, when they may have their own homes, they will know that they went through this. When my grandmother and my mother were in there, I would water the plants, I would sow seeds, and I would, I would go and see how big the seedlings were. I watered them, I put water on them, and she did too. What did you sow? Through sowing, we sow in the children that sense of belonging, of loving the land, because we are practically alone. And when they see people who take us into consideration, they feel moved. And the boy says to me, Mom, let's go to the allotment. Mom, look at the plants, they're growing. It is something beautiful because I think this came from God. And now we need to help other people with love and affection. Everything is possible. Thank you. So now we will see a renewed space within faith-based organizations to tackle protection. So let's get started. World Vision is based in Venezuela since 2019. And from the first, from our first experiences, we corroborated that the food baskets weren't enough to alleviate the hunger of the most vulnerable in society. We also all observed that how the families have placed the greatest trust in faith-based organizations. And we noticed with worry how child labor and school absenteeism have increased in those homes where food is scarce with the worsening factor that this is becoming normalized within society. This increases the gaps for children to achieve a fuller life, a more fulfilled life. In this context, then we started to reflect on how to move towards a more sustainable solution within the humanitarian response. And as part of this idea, we came up with home allotments. The idea is to have some land nearby the houses where people can grow vegetables and food products to complement the diet. Thinking with this in mind, then we started to analyze who could we partner with, who could work on these with us. And we found Funda Crecer, which is a faith-based organization with which we had already had done some work around the delivery of food baskets. And 
we had provided them some training around child protection through a program led by World Vision to take to them. And the program was called Channels of Hope. And each of the members contributed and between all of them came up with a policy for child protection, which at the moment has been embraced by all their members and volunteers. Another element that we thought was interesting when working with Funda Crecer was their location. Let's fly to Venezuela so that you can see where Funda Crecer is. In Venezuela, very close to the city of Caracas, the capital city of the country, here is where Funda Crecer works. And they are focusing in Carpresal municipalities, Los Alias municipality, and Guaycaipuro. You can see how close it is from Caracas. And when you see it from afar, you can see that it's a mountain, mountainous area. So the advantage that had the location of Funda Crecer was that they can serve people from rural areas, suburban areas, and many of their members have enough space to fit this program of home allotments. So it was in this way that we got started with a project to serve 310 families with 310 allotments, home allotments, and each of these families had many children. And the project was complemented with the provision of food baskets during the first three months, one per month, to serve these families whilst they were getting their allotments started. We also gave them the inputs, materials, and technical assistance they needed. And then we started to observe that the parents, the adults, were very interested in involving the children and teenagers in the activities linked to the project. Not only that, but the children could notice this interest and also showed interest themselves. And look at these photos here, how the mother lets the child go first. And when they approached Funda Crecer, when we were providing them some materials, the boys and girls then voluntarily involved themselves in the project activities. And these led us then to think that we need to make the most, we need to leverage this opportunity to highlight protection, to focus on protection, not only to have it as a guide to work around protection, but to protect them. And that is why the time came to introduce some changes to this project. The first one was to leverage this project that was a food security project initially, but we could it could be used as a vehicle for protection. And what we did was train the staff of Funda Crecer and making sure that they also had early warning systems around school absenteeism and child labor. Another important change was to introduce a systematization of the experience from the perspective of girls, boys, and teenagers. And this was applied throughout the duration of the project. How they saw and understood the project they were working on and bringing forward in this way. The project was focusing on food security and allotments. It grew and it became a much more important project involving children. The activities were carried out and we noticed that 99% of participating families 
adopted strategies to actively integrate children in the home allotments in a voluntary manner. So what we did was accompany them on the initiatives that they were coming up with. We also guided them and we never saw that these allotments affected negatively the children's performance in school. The project followed the traditional cycle that we had designed and these changes that we introduced when we included children did not change the cost of the project or the activities. There were just minor adjustments necessary. For example, in the systematization tasks, these worked very well with monitoring tasks and the observation activities also joined married well with all the other activities planned for the project. In this way, then, we could see something that was interesting with all the challenges that the families faced during the project. There were different degrees of challenges. There was the pandemic. There was low mobility. And the conversations within households and the arguments within households, uh, we analyzed how these were affected or changed by the allotment. And we identified that the most creative solutions came from children and teenagers. And we saw that decisions were made by the whole family. They proposed alternatives as a family and discussed their options. In this way, we saw that at the end, despite all the challenges, 99% of participant families completed the project and continued to grow their own food products in the allotments. We are no longer working there because the project came to an end, but we noticed this growth within the family fabric and the learning for us in World Vision as part of the project cycle and learning for Funda Crecer to have more tools to try to work in all areas of protection and also to improve the life quality of children through better food products. I know we're running out of time, so I won't go into too much detail, but it has all been documented and we are telling people about the success of the project by giving voice to the children themselves. And food security has grown, has been improved, and with this dish that was grown with trust, with trust and hope. Thank you, and over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your work um, or for highlighting the work of your team, because I know that it's a, a number of people who've um, been working on this project for, for so long and that, that you wrapped up. Um, so just reflecting a little bit on what you said of thinking about those linkages between food security and child labor, how you are the prevention of child labor, how you talk about participation of children. I thought that was quite an interesting um, aspect of the community orchards. Um, and I, I reflect back on um, a presentation yesterday that looked at the linkages between food security and children's mental health and well-being. Um, and when you talk about there being hope, that there being trust, these are some of the fundamental um, uh, you know, aspects of uh, positive uh, mental health. So lovely to have that presentation from you and we'll have a chance for some questions in a little bit. Um, I want to now pass the floor to two other colleagues. Um, I'm going to be introducing to you Morris, uh, sorry, Boris Aristen Gonzalez, uh, who heads up uh, protection analysis at the Global Protection Cluster. Boris, is that the first time you've been called Morris? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> 
I only can tell you that I am the one in, uh, in El Salvador, but the last week I was in Guatemala and I invited to four colleagues to, uh, to Starbucks for a coffee. They wrote for, in four different ways my name. So it's not a problem. <laughs> It was more my enunciation, but maybe in my mind for now, forever now, you'll be more. Maurice is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Leila. Leila Tazi is a programs policy officer and a protection focal point with the World Food Program. So you two have been collaborating for a little while now between the World Food Program and um, the Global Protection Cluster. And you've decided to focus on the, the, the need to improve our joint analysis. So let me turn the floor over to you to talk about how you did that, but also about what your initiative can teach us specifically in child protection as we go forward in more collaborative ways. Thank you very much, Joanna. And uh, thank you very much for your introduction because I think it speaks very well to what the aim of this work stream is, namely, a common understanding, building a common understanding between sectors to ensure that we operationalize the centrality of protection. That is one of the key aims of this work stream and also enhancing um, how we complement each other from different sectors. So I'll, I'll start presenting the problem statement that then brought us to the realization that we had to collaborate more closely and Boris will present uh, more concrete examples of how we made that happen. If I can have the next slide, please. So um, one of the main realizations is that despite the need and the realization that we need the, the centrality of protection, the reality is that organizations working in the field have relatively narrow mandates, which doesn't allow them to really grasp the complexity of the risks that populations are facing. Of course, here we're talking about protection, but this applies very much to child protection in particular too. And um, so the fact that children, but populations in general are affected by a multiplicity of risks. So it's not just about food security, of course, or, or questions directly linked to child protection, but a very complex and correlated risks. And the need to really um, integrate a comprehensive approach to analysis. So there's a lot of assessment, joint assessment tools, but how do we really build the analysis together to really be able to comprehend the risks and the threats that populations are exposed to. Because with this narrowness of mandates, there is a big impact on also the way that humanitarian response is going to be designed. Uh, can I ask you for the next slide, please? So what usually happens, and uh, thankfully not uh, in, in the example that Patricia presented, which actually is a very beautiful example of how we can really build between sectors and have other types of outcomes than the, 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 the initial ones that we design, designed for, is that usually protection programs tend to overlook the realities of hunger. They tend to focus specifically on protection risks, but not see the people in their entirety and all the trade-offs that people are putting to actually um, yeah, to reduce their, um, their risks and, and their food insecurity. And the same on the other side of, of the medal, let's say, that food assistance usually is quite narrow, again, is very focused on, um, on that specific outcome and doesn't look at the people that we serve in their entirety. And again, those uh, trade-offs and the tensions and the compromises, compromises that populations do to actually um, uh, handle their food security. And the way that uh, food security scores are rated do not take that into account. Food security scores do not take into account what people had to trade off to actually have maybe a better score, let's say, in terms of food security. So that is the problem statement, which then took us to create uh, this work stream. I'll pass on to Boris to give us more concrete examples of how we operationalize this. 
Leila, thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much to to everyone for for showing an uh, interest on this uh, on this discussion. And uh, the next slides are going to be showing you some case studies. Oh well, uh, maybe we can just start um, with some of the the aspects now regarding what is the the work stream that we have initiated because it's for protection and it's also for all the different areas of responsibility. As you know. And if you have been working in the in the analysis in the in the field, what we do with areas of responsibility and the protection cluster is to foster and to really work together, as we are doing at the moment in uh, all the three countries of North uh, Central America, to make a joint analysis. And that recalls me to one of the comments from Joanne at the beginning and the child protection minimum standards. Myself, I used to work in the area of responsibility during the time that they were produced. And uh, just the introduction of that uh, that session, you, uh, of that section of the minimum standards, if you re remember, Joanna, it took like one year and a half of, of more, no? The difference between mainstreaming, uh, integration, et cetera. And now we have a very solid and consolidated document so that we are inviting you to use and to keep considering as reference. But when Joanna was showing you the pillars about breaking the silos, uh, I think that the, this work stream is very much connected with the evidence and learning and with the coordination and collaboration. And both of them, they go very much together. If we collaborate, if we exchange, uh, as we are going to show the different uh, case studies that we, we have been double, uh, developing during 2022, uh, you will see that when you put the partners, the key actors together is when we have very good outcomes. And that's why the, the Global Protection Cluster has one working group, which is the one of information and analysis, and we decided to make a work stream on food security and protection. And always that we talk as, as protection, always think about child protection, uh, gender-based violence, mine action, and HLP, together with the other topics, protection topics that they don't conform one uh, specifically, one uh, area of responsibility. And what we are doing as a work stream is to move towards a, a more comprehensive, integrated and rounded, a more effective joint analysis and response program. We were having several initiatives in the past. And now what we are talking about is not about trying to influence with protection aspects, the food security, data collection and analysis, or vice versa. It's much more of if we have very good tools, if we have a system already in place and that happens systematically with our respective constituencies, let's keep working. And then, or during the process, let's sit together. Uh, the examples, they are going to be uh, from different uh, protection analysis updates that they have been recently published, but I will give you uh, one that happened last week in Guatemala itself during the joint analysis sessions, including the colleagues from, uh, from food security. And again, it focuses on the analysis. And if we have a joint analysis and a common understanding, ideas and initiatives as the one that Patricia was showing uh, within her own organization with the same logic, it will happen. And uh, that's why we are very much open to have the collaboration from the different range of uh, partners, NGOs, national and international, and stakeholders to collaborate in this process. At, at country level, it happens within the, the protection and uh, area of responsibility coordination mechanism. And at global level, uh, we are very much welcoming to, to membership. At the moment, as we speak, uh, and considering that this work stream was, uh, was established in January, let's say, late December uh, last year, but in January 2022, we have the Global Protection Cluster, International Rescue Committee, Plan International and, w and WFP as key uh, partners of the, of the work stream, which is going ongoing on continuous basis. If we can move to the to the next slide, thank you. And just for showing you, and I will not start uh, sharing with you all the percentages and the data, which will make the presentation very boring, but let's give a couple of tips about uh, what happened when we uh, work together. You know, regretfully, uh, around mid-February 2022, uh, it was an important attack from armed groups to the IDP camps in the Ituri province in Congo. And we decided to make an analysis, but also an advocacy note, uh, which goes together regarding the situation that was happening in the Ituri province. Uh, that was happening where, in the meanwhile, that with Leila and the rest of colleagues of WFP, we were discussing about how to organize the, the, this work stream. And we had the right person from WFP and we had the right people from, uh, from uh, protection, also from, uh, with the support of the, of the global protection cluster to introduce as a protection risk, also food insecurity. And here you have the result. And what we were doing, it was just, this is a good example of from the IPC, the, the ranking system that WFP has, and is one of the landmarks of the humanitarian analysis. 
and the, in the work of the protection analysis update, we were making this joint analysis, considering data, and when you put it together, you realize that the most affected areas by violence are also those ones that they are affected by more chronic food insecurity. That it became a set of recommendations that they are included in the in the PAO. They are all these documents. They are available for everyone, and recommendations about keep sitting together and keep fostering this uh, this integration. One of the big outcomes, because sometimes as we are always working in silos, uh, we have uh, the people, our teams, our field colleagues. Initially, they don't understand it. They believe that food security is a silo, protection is a silo, or we believe that child protection is a silo, and that has to be broken. We need to broken in a, in a smooth way. We need to ensure and to foster interaction. In these initial steps, we were questioned about why food security is integrated in this protection analysis, because protection analysis is, is protection. No, When they started to see the results, here you have it. It's very clear and it's uh, really fostering. We are the initial steps with the joint analysis and the evidence, but then we keep fostering the collaboration and the coordination. And we hope that uh, we will have an integrated approach you know, as the introduction of the minimum standards uh, reflects. You know, integration is when we look forward to uh, for implementing joint outcomes. If we move to the next slide, here we have the same. Uh, it's not uh, by chance that the highest percentage of people with uh, in food insecurity are also with the displaced population and also in the situations where the IDP camps they are getting close in, uh, in Eastern Congo. If you see again, is how simple and as soon as you introduce the topic and you dedicate a minimum time with the colleagues, the joint analysis starts to happen. Again, in, a, in Nigeria for the Portland State, one of the recommendations is to keep uh, getting deeper into the linkages between food insecurity, displacement, violence, etc. Uh, and if we go to the, to the next uh, one, in Sudan, we have the same analysis where we have highest, uh, highest rates of violence. Uh, we have the depending question of uh, in, uh, in Darfur of the durable solutions, etc. You will see that the IPC, the level is level three in terms of food insecurity and is affected and also in North uh, in Northeast uh, Sudan. So there is always a, a correlation between the areas that protection considers as priority and food insecurity considers as, uh, as priority. And it's the question of, Food security has an incredible tool already defined, which is widespread all across the countries, and it's a clear reference for taking uh, for taking decisions and strategic at a strategic and operational level. Uh, that it is, and we are supporting uh, Leila's team also to introduce an aspects about uh, having a better comprehensive uh, comprehension of uh, protection uh, at the time of collecting and analyzing data, but. The use of this data for protection uh, purposes and the use of the protection analysis uh, framework and rational for the IPC, this cross-fertilization uh, between sectors is what uh, we found uh, extremely useful. And uh, if we go to the next, which is another example, uh, is the one of Northern Ethiopia where the displacement uh, matches regretfully also with the highest rates of food insecurity. Uh, these are examples, and uh, we, are, we will be very happy to go into the details about how it was the rational, uh, which kind of data and approach we were taking, but let me finalize with one additional example, which is the analysis that we were doing last week, uh, until yesterday, in Guatemala. And uh, in Guatemala, it was the, if you have a look to the humanitarian response over there, they will, you will read two priorities, natural disasters, yes, Guatemala ranks fourth in the uh, across the most prone uh, the most prone countries to suffer natural disasters between 1996 to 2022 they have faced it. Uh, 15 uh, high natural disasters there are continuous no but uh, from volcanoes earthquakes hurricanes etc and they were and it was also like the mythification of one area called the dry corridor in Guatemala where the food insecurity was the highest that was the rumor that was like the, the, what you were talking in the in the country that was my, that was uh, making that the protection actors they were thinking that they should focus the protection response all across protection and areas of responsibility into the dry corridor as priority for the country when you have a look about the evolution of the food insecurity and analysis since 2017 in Guatemala you will see that yes the dry corridor is a priority area, uh, Leila is level three, but 60% uh, of the country all across is also level three. So just to put that on the table, when we started the discussions like uh, 13th, 14th of June, the, narr the narrative it was, the dry corridor should be a priority. As soon as we took 
uh, started the collaboration with the food security co uh, colleagues, and we brought the IPC into the table and we integrated it in, into our own uh, severity scale, severity ranking. All the constituencies realized that we are not talking only about one thirteen percent of the country. We are talking about sixty percent of the country under le under level three of uh, food insecurity, and that really helped us to change the perspective. And now, at the moment, the colleagues that they are finalizing the uh, the production of the, of the narrative, they have changed you now the approach about how they need to be uh, focusing and addressing uh, protection and also to foster the collaboration with uh, food security actors. I will stop here, colleagues, but uh, very happy to to discuss any aspect on detail. Thanks so much, Boris. Leila, do you want to say a few words to wrap up? No, thank you. I think we're good and we will have a bit of space during the breakout rooms, if anything. And also, if you, if any organizations are uh, willing to collaborate also on this work stream, um, we will leave our contact, Boris and I. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And as, I, as Leila has mentioned, we're going to go into breakout rooms in a few minutes and you'll have a chance perhaps to have Boris or Leila in your room to ask any questions, but we're gonna generate questions to come back to have a general Q&A. Before we do that though, we have um, a fourth presenter, um, but before even maybe we get to Marcello, I'm gonna invite you at the halfway point to stretch up and to do a little reach over, little movement of the fingers, that's it Boris moving there to kind of keep us flexible as we go through these three days of the the global alliances meetings for those of you who've been in many sessions i'm sure your body's getting a little bit stiff so give it some love that's it give it a little bit of love all those joints <clears throat> all right let us come to uh, our last speaker um and it's great pleasure um someone who i see at every annual meeting but unfortunately don't see outside of this our marcello viola uh, is the protection advisor for Street Child. And his little intro is going uh, into your chat box. Um, Marcello, we've been looking at ways to disrupt uh, the silos in which we work. And I know that at Street Child, uh, I think particularly in Ghana, you've been leading the way and in other of your locations about breaking down those silos, particularly with food security. Um, that's easier said than done and i'm sure you have a number of lessons that you can learn but i'm wondering if you can explain some of the opportunities you found in doing this work some of the obstacles and the solutions that you've come up with uh, and particularly uh, how it's related to kind of your interaction with donors and, and how you've been able to fund or not fund um, this uh, more integrated approach to to working yeah Thank you very much, uh, John. It's nice to to be here. Uh, as you say, like to 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 have this kind of work, uh, you know, we we need uh, funding for for integrated work, but uh, it's easier uh, to be said that than done. Um, in fact, when when we did the initial uh, mentimeter, I think it was also interesting to see how many are coming from the donor. Uh, 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 group um, in addition to you know the, the kind of sector uh, people are working in maybe something we could consider at the end <laughs> uh, you know there, there is a general agreement in principle but it's not often translated into into practices when designing a, a program because donors have their own uh, objectives their own priorities um, as child protection agencies and and practitioners here I think we should continue advocating for funding for for con, you know developing more integrated work um, that have improved protection and, and child protection outcome uh, as also Boris say and as we just saw the majority of humanitarian emergency are also mainly protection crisis so this this should be um, clear uh, for me like what is required here is to um, ensure that we have funding for expertise or experience um, personnel for, for child protection who have the capacity to provide those services that are in line with the global standard, with the child protection minimum standard, and to monitor the quality of the implementation. Uh, also funding for, for protection activities that are for and with the children. Uh, I'm thinking of activities like um, MHPSS uh, for, for children, but also as we saw uh, these days also for parents, maybe the use of conditional cash uh, to promote positive uh, behavioral change uh, among other activities. And most important, I think also allowing uh, prevention uh, work rather than only response with the confidence that 
you know, there are already enough evidence uh, of the benefits. We can continue, you know, these are, these are platforms that we, we have to, to bring more evidence, but I think, you know, we, we already hear a lot and, and, and a lot is there that could um, uh, influence donor uh, decision. And uh, also, I think it is important to provide additional funding and also time to, to work together um, strategically to develop common framework, you know, those templates, those tools, those packages that can capture better this integrated outcome um, as it is now happening uh, between the global protection and the global food security and livelihood cluster, as we just uh, heard. Um, Street Child has a model that is already built as an intersectoral uh, approach that requires integration across different sectors. And one action is more effective if it goes hand by hand with, um, with the others. As many agencies here, I saw that we are a lot coming from, from child protection. We have a child-centered approach that requires increased capacity of the caregivers, of the communities, of the schools, and also other systems, including the government, to support the children in being safe, in being schools, and, and in their learning. Uh, so we work with the local organization implementing programs that are built around the area, mainly of education, child protection, and livelihood. But also we acknowledge that children have a range of, of other needs and hence we integrate with other sectors as health, hygiene, nutrition, um, and others basically as required, especially when possible in terms of capacity, in terms of funding, in terms of available partners, and also when we are best positioned to do uh, so. Uh, I say it is too often very articulated to find funding that allows this, this kind of work, but always um, need to seek individual fund to, for, for the different component no? to build our puzzle. Uh, I see that we become sometimes as a, for those also that need to, to, to raise fund, we become a kind of acrobats and equilibrist and in the, in the circus, uh, trying to keep all these pieces together. But the reality is that often there's no alignment with the, the timeline of a fund or, or the location of implementation. So eventually you can't really have the full package in one community or for one family. Uh, too often we are told that we can ask to other donors to complement, or maybe during implementation, we can refer to other agencies in other sector when we need specific services. But we also know that often uh, this is not really effective. It depends from many variables. Um, personal experience is often that even within the child protection uh, sector, when reaching some key donor of child protection and maybe trying to bring livelihood component that are an alternative to cash for protection, I hear like that is not possible because that is, you know, it's mainly from the food security and livelihood sector. So I should try to, um, to, to deal with those, de those donors. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the food security and livelihood sector and the child protection have many interconnections. We have, I think for time's sake, I can go fast on the, on the theory of change, but you know, there, there's so many um, um, linearity of, you know, like loss of livelihood um, that uh, brings to low level of food security that leads to increased adoption of negative coping strategies and bring um, parents to, 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 to affect, you know, they're affected by, on their mental health and their physical health. And this is what increased the, the, the risks for, for those negative um, coping mechanisms. Now, of course, this sequence that we see here is not really so linear, but it's, it's very interconnected and, and complex. Uh, there is interconnection among the risk factors, the causes and the consequences. Um, so, you know, this framework might be more complex and, and interlinked. Now, uh, in 2019 and 20, so before COVID and a yeah, few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to catch the interest of a food security and livelihood donor uh, presenting our livelihood package. This is what I was selling, let's say, in a very cynical uh, way. Uh, that was mainly around the income generated activity that was aligning with the donor interest in reducing reliance on food aid. Now, through this fund, we were able to mainstream uh, some child protection activity rather than be fully integrated. Um, and we had to negotiate uh, a lot. Now, if we see about this program, we have um, a food 
um, a full package of services for, for food security and livelihood that were included the cash grant, coaching and counseling for incentivized savings scheme to support the, the caregivers to develop sustainable source of livelihood. We include the setup of um, the VSLA, the Village Saving and Loan Association, uh, the provision of um, uh, voucher for, for food. There was also a component of nutrition with social and behavioral change session that was increasing the knowledge um, of the pregnant and lactating woman on, on, uh, on child nutrition. So the first um, challenge we encountered but was solved about was about how to select the beneficiaries. Um, we introduced the additional criteria on the, on the tool from, from, from the donor and partner that had a little bit more focus on the uh, children. For instance, to look at how many children were in the household, how many were girls, how many were uh, out of school or, or unaccompanied or separated, um, and how many uh, meals the children were eating uh, per day. Uh, the second challenge was, as I say, not having enough funding to, to, to carry on uh, child protection activity like case management or, for instance, psychosocial support for, for, for children. Now, the saving group and the uh, social and behavioral change session were for us our entry point to do more activities uh, with the caregivers. So we use a combination of uh, community awareness to, to have a minimal knowledge uh, to identify and report risks and also to, to promote positive uh, parenting. Um, as they say, we didn't have enough for, for other direct activities, and this was a limitation. Now, briefly, for time sakes, I say we already have enough evidence out there. Um, uh, I can share some of the, those key protective factors that have been um, contributing, strengthening um, the, the, the child's safety net and, and well-being. So by the end of the project, we saw an increase of 87% among caregivers that were reporting capacity to save, and an increase of 64% of households that were able to move from uh, only one or two meals per day to a normal situation of three meals per day. So removing a, cre a key stressor uh, for, for the parents. Uh, both saving capacity and the increased food consumption uh, gave better chances for caregivers to spend more on other important aspects, uh, especially on medical expenses or, and school fees. I think great results were also coming from the nutrition component um, that will, I mean, will have a long lasting impact on the child uh, health and growth. And, uh, and finally, 79% um, of children interviewed reported their perceived improvement of relationship with, the, with their parents, while 62% reported, 62 reported an improved well-being and self-esteem as the likely consequence of living in a more nurturing environment. This was measured uh, by adapting the, the well-being assessment tool uh, and ask only around those few domains um, that were around, around well-being and resilience that were more under uh, control of this project based on the activity. Now, uh, if this initiative was coming through an integrated or multi-sectorial uh, fund, we could have likely had uh, the chance to strengthen the common theory of change and the logical framework, uh, incorporating child protection tools that would have allowed um, to explore more the impact of food security and livelihood component on child protection, uh, risk prevention, for instance, on, I don't know, child labor or early, early marriage. Uh, I think that addressing the, 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 the sustainable development goal um, one and two for no poverty at zero hunger uh, that are normally within the food security and livelihood focus will contribute or are necessary to uh, sustainable goal like three and, and 16.2 on good health and well-being uh, and, uh, and all form of violence against children that is more within our uh, sphere of uh, interest. So despite this challenge, we saw and can reflect more on how, uh, for instance, child friend, in a simple uh, language, I, how child-friendly space could help the parents to have time to go and collect the voucher for, for food or to focus on their business. Uh, or put, maybe providing food or, or means of livelihood while children are under case management would assure that comprehensive or holistic package for, for the child. So eventually, 
the two are, are supporting uh, each other. Now, uh, since all these uh, uh, protection activities are so integral, uh, we can see that we need donor to commit to provide resources for child protection to address all these interrelated issues uh, in line with this integrated theory of change to see happier family where children can go uh, can grow better and, and healthier. So I think there will also be uh, a benefit over the value for money because there is also more efficient use of um, resources and reduce operational cost. Uh, if we can reach some minimum desired result with minimum resources, as this was, I think we can do much more or better uh, with more dedicated funding. Uh, otherwise, we could, as a protection, a child protection practitioner, continue to learn the skills about uh, acrobats and uh, and <laughs> uh, in the circles to to put that puzzle together. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Marcello. Thank you for uh, the theory of change that you presented, the research that's come out of it. You know, and and uh, it it strikes me how. Um, how much we have to be adaptable and flexible and how much we have to respond to the realities that are presented when there is funding and also when there isn't funding, but we still see opportunity for making these integrated changes and, and so on. So um, I think it's a great example that you've presented for us. We're now going to move to um, breakout rooms. Um, people are going to be assigned randomly unless you have asked to stay in this main room because you would like interpretation in which case you will stay with myself and uh, Patricia. Otherwise, um, you will be moved to, um, or you have to accept, I think, the, the, the movement to a room uh, with either Marcello, Leila, Boris, um, or my colleague, Sandra. And we're going to be asking two questions, uh, which I think should be on the next slide, uh, or maybe we've, we've lost them a little bit. They'll come up in the chat. Um, there will be a Jamboard for you to put up um, some ideas. The first one is, will you share any opportunities for action or further reflection that have been triggered by the session so far? So what opportunities do you see for us to move forward in these integrated ways, particularly with food security? And then we generate questions for us to talk about or, or to get answers from the presenters or from each other. So what are two questions you as a group have for one or more of the speakers. And then finally, if you have any practical resources that you're missing to do this work, this collaborative work more effectively, could you let us know by some post-it notes? So please use the jam boards that are provided for each room. You have 10 minutes and then we will bring you back. All right, we'll have a group of about five or six practitioners, I think, staying in this room. But we will give our colleagues some time to exit to the other room. And please, those of you who are staying here, do find the Jamboard link in the, um, it's being sh shared with us on the screen. We're lucky uh, to find the Jamboard link in the chat. Please go there so that you can directly put in your questions, your opportunities that you see for us to move forward, and also any resources you think are missing that maybe one of the actors here or myself through the CPMS working group at the Alliance might be able to say, oh, it does already exist. Let us provide it to you or let us um, let us co-create it with you or the sector um, writ large. All right, I'm gonna assume, um, I can see, I guess, who's left in the room. I can see people I don't know. So I see Claudia, I see Matthew, I see Mac, which I don't know if that's a Mac and Mac is in an iPad or um, uh, ourselves. I see Stephanie, Patricia, and then that might be it. I think that everyone else might be technical in the background, but if not, 
um, please feel free to, to speak up as we go. So people are writing, which is great. Practical conversations with donors. This is an opportunity or a reflection. Don't know if whoever put that would like to speak to it briefly. That was me. I think it's an opportunity, um, but a question uh, might be like a, how to do it in a genuinely uh, like a useful forward moving way, you know, like a, how to make that kind of conversation actually genuinely helpful and useful um, and less uh, maybe abstract. How to have practical conversations with donors. Okay, an opportunity and a, and a question. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Anyone else have a, a reflection or a question that you would like to put to the sectors, to the speakers or so on? Again, I'm not find it hard to look at my Jamboard and see who, who is still with us. Let's see, I probably can do it. So there's something in the chat box. In the chat, there two questions. Yes, there were two questions in the chat. I've got them here. And there were okay. two for me. Okay, so let's, we can put them up here as well. I'm going to write it in Spanish, it's Patricia saying that she's going to write in, or do you want her to tell you and I'm going to interpret that for you to write it down in English, is that okay, Joanna? Uh, I think it's fine she wants to uh, write it in Spanish. Can she do it in Spanish? Okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Ah, sí, sí. Somebody has just put the question in English already in the Jamboard. Super. Any other challenges or, you know, one of the things that we talked about yesterday are misunderstandings between the sectors. So I'm wondering what were what are misunderstandings that protection has about food security and that food security may have about protection or child protection? Could someone write that up on the Jamboard for me? Because for some reason I closed, excuse me, I closed my Jamboard. Because I know that I mean, uh, Leila spoke to it a little bit um, at the beginning of her presentation, but I wonder if there's, um, uh, you know, some some more thinking or more reflection that we should do, uh, those of us who are in child protection, about how we come across uh, our assumptions about others, um, uh, their assumptions about us. What you know, we think they know, but they don't know. Um, so, yeah, to me, that that is one of the interesting questions. I put that sticky up there. Did that capture what you were trying to say about? sort of assuming things of each other and misunderstanding things, is that? Yeah, I, th I think that it does, thank you. Yep. Any opportunities that people can think? Any, I mean, it could be at the global level, it could be at the regional level, it could be within your organization, because I know that some people here are in very large organizations that have multiple sectors and I think one of the points, and maybe this can be a reflection, maybe I can figure out how to get my own reflections up on here, but reflections around Patricia talking about faith-based organizations, many local actors, um, whether that's an NGO or, or not, they don't see these divisions the way that we have created them in the humanitarian structure. So I think that's an opportunity. Um, that local actors, it, it's, it's, it maybe goes with a localization agenda that um, let us 
let us see ourselves more as we are seen at the community level, at the, at the recipients level and so on. I don't know if that resonates with others. I'm trying to think kind of what my wording is. So this could be an opportunity to be more realistic. I don't think that's quite the right word. Be more humble, <laughs> maybe. Patricia, were you left with other questions when you finished the, when you closed out the community orchard project? Were there, was there a next phase that you wish you could have gone on with or delved deeper? Yes, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to start a second phase because we could scale up, incorporating now even the um, refectories or the canteens. So now that is to scale up the project, which is a community project, because uh, they have gone through the uh, sort of the family garden project. So they feel they are trained to scale up another level and to work at the community level with community gardens. And now what we are trying to do is that the products, the food from this um, vegetable garden from the community, they can be used in a community refectory, in a community canteen. So it is a second uh, aspect, a second version of this project, which is uh, bigger. It is the last step of the uh, food security, incorporating this uh, child protection aspect and also the systematization of the experience. That's all we have managed to do. We caps encapsulate that somehow as an opportunity for you know moving forward into one of the into a post-it in Spanish is fine. Mm. Bueno, la oportunidad es, um... well, the opportunity is the opportunity is to scale up the project, to scale up the project to all the chain to all the food chain from the planting of the food to the table right. from the farm to the fork and this uh, encompasses other sectors like for example the educational sector which is also included so interestingly in your project there was work obviously within child protection food security was there explicitly in the first round work with education, mental health, uh, maybe physical health too? I don't know. No, in the first project. No, in the first project, we only focused on the training, the technical assistance, the technical training. It was really an observation, really, to see how parents treated the children because um, otherwise uh, it was going to be lots of different aspects. It was just like an observation, really, what we did in the first project. And then what we did was to, what we did was um, sort of, uh, we sort of adapted the level of the trainings for the children. So we adapted the language because the children were present there when we had these technical assistance, this technical training in the vegetable gardens. Okay. I think the other groups are quite small and I think we've all now come back together. I didn't see the notification, but we're all now back together, which is great. So we have a few minutes um, to look at some of the, um, uh, or to hear from you about any of your observations and reflections and so on. Uh, and then we'll have a few minutes to um, ask questions and, and see, what, see what questions have come forward, if any of them are similar and we can put them to our panelists. Um, does any group want to talk about an observation, a reflection, an opportunity that you see going forward? Um, maybe I can uh, start. I was, uh, okay, sorry, I didn't see your hand, Boris. Go ahead, please. No, 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 we are going to talk about the same, so Marcelo, please go ahead. That's right. <laughs> We were in the same group eventually, two panelists. Uh, um, there were no external participants. Uh, no, there was one. Uh, I think we discussed about so like looking at funding opportunity, how to arrive there um, in consideration of some of the, the evidence that are already available. Of course, making a, a strong case studies 
uh, collecting all those those evidence together uh, would be one. Probably also learning uh, from the the journey that the the global education cluster and the child protection uh, uh, the the global um, the child protection area of responsibility took to arrive you know, in a situation where um, um, the integration was uh, finally more uh, understood and also supported by, by donors. Like, of course, maybe that is a sector that is kind of more obvious that the interlink and the relation, but, um, you know, we, we, we can start uh, a new journey. And, uh, and probably there are some of key donors in the area of child protection and, and food security or livelihood to, uh, key agencies that are also donors that could probably uh, open the open the window, like set the um, uh, set the ground by by giving the example by committing in in more um, uh, flexibility in 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 their in their funding. So probably that could also influence uh, other other donors to 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 join or follow the, this example. Super, thank you. I know that in our room there was um, discussion about having kind of practical, um, I don't know how we reflected it, opportunity and questions about how to have practical conversations with donors once they've been identified, or if you think there's room to grow a donor in that direction, how to have very concrete discussions with them about this approach. and. Um, whether it's cost zero and it's just permission to go and do it, or whether there is um, some initial uh, extra cost. Um, or I think yesterday we had um, one donor had told people, well, we're not keen on that because it will mean less reach for food security because it's added uh, activity. So how to have those practical discussions. I don't know, Boris, Leila, um, uh, Marcelo, if, if you could speak to that kind of concern um that donors aren't you know that we're not equipped to have those conversations yet a couple of very quick thoughts uh, and i'm not still enough uh, no, no, not still the time for the rest of colleagues but uh change of minds it takes time and uh, all across uh, protection was not very strong in terms of analysis as we speak about uh, our uh, uh, our side of the story we needed to invest a lot in terms of protection analysis this is starting to change and the next step definitely is when analysis uh, finalizes ends whatever is advocacy communications and keeping system is the next step now one of the initial comments that we were having is that one of the opportunities that we are starting to have now is to convince the humanitarian country team which once they are convinced then the decisions they can start just uh, training down the the, uh, the rest of the strategic and operational uh but goes step by step education uh was not considered a life-saving activity and the colleagues that they are working from save the children with uh, for, uh, with save the children they will remember in 2006 7 all the all the advocacy global advocacy campaign that we were uh, carrying out etc and it took time myself i was very generally invited to leave the room when i was talking to a donor saying education is part of the humanitarian response and they smile and they said get out of here uh, so yes over to you it takes time but i think that insistence is very important super should we pass uh, anyone else on that on that point around donors Uh, sorry, maybe if I might, um, when 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 you mention like that, uh, often we are not equipped for for such uh, move. Uh, do we speak also about capacity, like um, um, you know, looking up, sharing some some experience where uh, for new programs sometimes I've been told that uh, you know being livelihood uh, a different sector we might not be able to. You know, uh, to 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 deliver those activities uh, properly, even though as a you know, uh, when I present the work the organization uh, does, livelihood is a, is a key component. So often, um, you know, it's like how how the, the the evidence of good work can be there. So it's it's not really a justification, but as well, uh, um, collaboration, partnership, consortium are, are you know like a strategy to 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 bring the different capacity uh, on ground. And then uh, I think also globally there are different organizations that are uh, from the two sectors that are working uh, well together, trying to explore um, way of uh, of synergies. 
um, and and those consortiums should should be promoted. This this kind of collaborations. Super. Thanks, Marcelo. Leila, did you want to speak to this? Wasn't sure. No, I just wanted to speak to the collaboration and the enthusiasm of collaborating and maintaining. I think bodies is a very good illustration of maintaining hope and knowing that it's going to take time and that it's about repeating messages and indeed keeping strong between sectors towards donors. And I think that even that approach is very essential, showing that we're a common uh, yeah, front is, is very essential. Great so. point. Sandra, let's turn the floor over to you because you were compiling some questions for us. What were some of the questions that came up in the Jamboards? Yeah, so there are a few. They were around uh, the donors, how to engage donors, uh, well, the strategy, but I think we kind of spoke to that already. So I would prioritize um, other questions. So there is one directed to Patricia on, uh, so it seems that in your project, the home garden project, there is um, one of the outcome was improved relationship between children and, and caregivers. So um, the question is, were you able to measure it? And uh, did the project provide any support or guidance to caregivers on how to strengthen the relationship with their children? Or did this happen naturally? Gracias, Sandra. Um, Thank you, Sandra. Yes, I was looking at this question and yes, the answer is yes, we could measure this difference in the family relationships through the systematization of the experiences. This systematization was designed by a psychologist, by a sociologist and by a social worker. And they tried to do the systematization with regards to document uh, in an organized manner what we did in the project. But more than that, they tried to understand how the project uh, was being experienced by each one of the boys and girls and teens who took part in the project. So with their own instruments, this team, these psychologists, this uh, social worker with um, uh, drawings, with um, focal groups, from the images that I showed you, and with their expertise, these professionals, they did their analysis. It is documented with numbers, with figures. So they identified that some, uh, for example, sentences like, now I got along, I get along much better with my grandma. I obey her more now, I'm, I'm older now, and things like that. So these type of results really um, showed us that the family relationship had improved. Also, the systematization gave us comparative elements with other similar experiences that they had had before. There is a collection of um, data, for example, of evidences in which the boys and girls and teens, they compared their experiences with um, a vegetable garden from the school and what they were living now with this project. This was very interesting because they could compare. And here we could see the impact that uh, the intervention of Funda Cresa, this faith-based faith organization we partnered with, uh, like, for example, the, the, the different um, uh, tools, these tools are cobbled with uh, smartphones, so it was great for them because they could take pictures of themselves. I mean, all these kind of things which had been measured uh, with a, in a very uh, strict and very professional way with these uh, sociologists, psychologists, and these social worker so with this designed with the systematization so that was one question and there were two more questions i don't know sandra if you want me to answer those um follow-up questions yeah or do you want me to was... wait for you to say the <laughs> no, it was if this happened naturally or if it was kind of planned and then there was some guidance to parents oh. just quickly I... because we don't have uh, a lot of time Sí. Sí. Hay un yes. 
there's something which was very interesting, which was the result of the analysis of the systematization. Yes, for sure, that's what we also put it in the beginning of the presentation. Fundacresta, this organization, had also been trained previously in a positive child in this uh, program, in this training. So we could see the, the originally Originally, the project wasn't really uh, focused on this part of this aspect of protection, but we realized that um, at the time we were um, having some um, um, less longing impacts from previous uh, projects. And this has to do with what has been said just now with the fact that it's something that takes time, as Boris says, it takes time. So yes, it was natural this uh, focus on the children and wanted to involve them was natural, yes. And to want to involve, and the parents wanted to involve the children, that was natural. What we did was to adjust. And then what we had was to emphasize all this uh, training, all this training on child protection. And what we did also was to strengthen the Funda Crecer staff to give them tools so they could identify potential risks of child labor of school dropout and or school absenteeism and to really be able to treat uh, children in, in, in the best possible way. So it was just a general a natural sort of um, uh, relationship, but we believe it is it comes from a previous project where this uh, Funda Crescent organization had been previously trained. And also we were very watchful that things will pan out in the desirable way in terms of child protection. Do you have any additional doubt? Oh, no, thank was it you, clear? Thank you, yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And I'm sorry Brilliant. that we're running out of time with uh, all of these good questions. Uh, please feel free to keep uh, putting answers and questions into the chat box and we can make sure that you're connected. If you are looking for more resources, there is um, a page on the Alliance website, which is uh, the Working Across Sectors Hub. And there you'll find information by sector, you'll find information kind of gl globally, kind of um, integrated, so to speak, across sectors um, about working together. You'll find our newly released intersectoral framework, uh, which is a document on the right. And there's like a one or two page summary in there and some some infographics that make it easy to read as well as lots of the research that went into building this common approach. Uh, a toolkit for language and building awareness about working together. Um, and then, as I said, we have some e course materials some videos um, and then these buttons are the image on the left. Uh, a button for each sector where we're hoping to put in key documents for working with children um, on their protection, but also with food security or with nutrition and so on. So with that, we have to wrap up. A huge thank you uh, to Boris, Marcelo, Leila, uh, and Patricia for putting together these presentations and being with us. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do uh, anything near as rich with just one or two of you. So thank you collectively. Um, they we're going to move to an infographic discussion now before closing out the day. Um, so we invite you to proceed there at the end of this session. Uh, but we also invite you to please do a little survey about how the session went so that we can build back even stronger next year. Uh, hopefully having you know moved forward on these conversations about integration, joint analysis, joint advocacy, um, working with donors uh, and so on and so forth. So thank you everybody and hope to see you later today in, in our closing out. Thank you very much to thank Joanna. You and Have everybody. The links that you need for the survey are in the chat now, so please do use them. And as uh, Joanna said, there's uh, uh, more infographic sessions going on, and do go to the homepage on Philo where you will find a link to Wheelo, the virtual coffee space where you will be able to meet more of the attendees and speakers from this excellent event. Thank you so much uh, to everyone and enjoy the rest of the sessions.